we have had uh, the system of education that we are sort of sitting in right now uh, for almost a century. Uh, it's changed very radically in that time, but the reality is that the tech college system is uh, over 100, just over 100 years old. In fact, I think MATC may date to 1911, sometime around then. Uh, at this point. Uh, other technical colleges date from that time. The public universities, as we know them, you know, emerged in the 1860s, but really uh, took off after World War II, the GI Bill and uh, you know, integration for our public university systems. Um, and in that time, people have been confronted with a critical question. People who are living within universities and colleges and within K through 12 uh, school systems uh, of uh, what to do about a system which is not under their control. Right? And they've repeatedly, um, in, in my uh, personal experience and also in my reading of history, have repeatedly come to the same set of conclusions once their <laughs> period of struggle has gotten to a point where it's more mature, it's more advanced, they've really come to grips with the power that exists within the education sector, whether that's boards of regions and the people who they are, the class that they represent and that they are members of, or whether that's school boards and the money that's spent on school boards or the money that's spent to take power away from elected school boards, depending on where you are in the country. But once people have dealt with these questions over time, they come to recognize that they don't actually have the power that they need in order to change policy, to change the financing of our public schools and our public colleges. And when they get to that point, they say, boy, we need more power. We need to organize. We need to be able to build wall to wall, which is to say that we need to organize everybody in this institution into one alliance, one federation, one union. And if you look at American history, there have been a number of times, and I'm sure that I'm hopeful that there'll be people who can contribute to this history, in fact, I know there are people here who can contribute to this history, uh, in the last uh, century where people have uh, sort of surged forward in this way. So the 1930s in particular were a critical time for campus unionism in higher education and in K through 12, right? Um, you see that, for example, uh, our earlier plenary panel, we had the Vice President of the United States Student Association. Well, there were actually a number of competing student unions in the 1930s and 1940s, and the United States Student Association is the descendant of one of those unions, actually the more conservative of them, although I would say that their leadership now is maybe returned to the politics of those who they used to fight with. Um, but you know, there are good reasons for people organizing student unions as opposed to student government associations in the 1930s. Students understood that they were workers, that they were workers as students, that they were workers after having been students, uh, and they saw themselves as part of an international movement. Right? And that period was from the 1930s till basically 1948, 49, and I think there's enough people in this room who are students of history to know what was going on at that time with union busting. It wasn't just labor unions, there was also student unions that were busted. Skip forward another generation of the late 1960s, early 1970s. Uh, you saw movements not only to revive the student union idea, it was called student syndicalism. Maybe some people in this room were involved in, in some of this history, so I'm interested in hearing about personal experience uh, with that. Uh, but you know, the, the movements that were uh, afoot here in Madison and around the United States at that time uh, were quite radical in their demands. They were fighting for democratic control of the universities. They were fighting for popular councils in our schools so that students, for example, in our high schools and middle schools would actually have control over curriculum, would have a say in participation in the governance of their schools so that students at the university and the colleges would have a say. They didn't win everything they were fighting for. Right? They didn't win everything that they were fighting for. They won some things. They won some things they weren't even fighting for. They won a shared governance statute here in Wisconsin. They won one in California and other states. Uh, they won students uh, who serve as elected members of boards of trustees and regents around the country. They won student affair committees you know, in various you know, metropolitan school districts around the country to give students a little bit of a say. Uh, they won student bill of rights policies. right? And you can sort of see most of my experiences come from the student end of this question. And then finally what I'll say is that in the 1990s, which is really the generation that I come up with, um, I think you saw, you began to see a resurgence of new interest in student unionism, in higher education unionism, and in education unionism. And I'll just define those 
briefly, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, our, my co-presenters here. Um, so student unionism is the idea that students must organize unions in order to be able to act collectively to achieve their goals around their immediate sets of interests and in order to be able to fight for the power and the say of students in um, education policy. Right? It's distinct from student government associations in the sense that student government associations tend to have a sort of hybrid role. They're both advocacy organizations and they're governmental. They're sort of co-opted, but they also try to uh, struggle with the uh, administrations that they're dealing with. Um, uh, you've seen student unions uh, you know, take effect both in uh, K through 12, and there they tend to be, in my uh, experience, they tend to be citywide organizations. They'll be at multiple schools when they survive for more than a year. Uh, you ra rarely see a high school student union that's just on one uh, high school campus. And then in higher education, they will tend to be state-based, right, uh, because of the structure of education in the United States and higher education. Then you talk about higher education unions, and there are only a couple examples of this that I'm aware of uh, in recent times. Uh, there's an organization called the Public Higher Education Network of Massachusetts. Is anybody familiar with that? Okay. Yeah, so, uh, it is a uh, organization of faculty, staff, students, and community members all in one organization. Uh, it is moving towards a higher education union model. And the idea of that higher education union model is that uh, you need to get the student associations in together with the faculty and the staff unions and the community groups and for it to be more than just a standing alliance, it has to actually move towards what a union looks like, right? People have voting rights, they have representation. The idea for that network came out of a meeting that the Liberty Tree Foundation organized in 2005. We brought people from the US to Canada, uh, figuring that people in the US had some things to learn, right, from the Canadians. So the folks in Massachusetts came back and they began to practice some of the ideas. The final idea is the idea of education unionism, which I have yet to see in a meaningful way. I mean, we see um, sectoral alliances between people in higher education and people in K through 12 um, emerge at times of heightened struggle. I mean, here in Wisconsin during the uprising, I tell people wherever I go, we had an education struggle, right? I mean, the students walked out all over the state. The teachers followed them, you know? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I taught my classes in the state capitol, you know, basement, right? But, you know, I was out in Richland County, and I pick up the local newspaper out there, and the Richland Observer shows a picture of 2,000 students, you know? The Richland High School kids and the other kids who came in, you know, they're there at the administration building sitting in, right? So you see, you know, in Chicago and Philadelphia, you've seen examples just in the last couple of years of effectively education-wide mobilizations, right? But I have yet to see an example of where um, uh, that moves into an organizational form, a union form, that can have lasting uh, power. And uh, so I'll just, you know, I just wanted to sort of set uh, you know, the groundwork here. Um, I'm going to, um, what I'll do is actually I'll give each of the presenters a chance to, to just say what you had prepared, and then I'll move to questions, if that's all right. Uh, rather than sort of forcing you to try to integrate the two. And I'll just move to my left here. Uh, so jo jo Jolie, <laughs> who I've known for several years, Jolie Lazan, uh, has done incredible work uh, on this convention, uh, and she's worked with the Wisconsin Wave, but she is primarily known in the Madison area as a student organizer at University of Wisconsin at Madison. And uh, you're gonna, and uh, you're an IES, you're an environmental studies and women's studies major. Uh, and uh, talk about the history of student organizing in Wisconsin. Yeah. All right. Do that. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Um, yeah, so one of the things that I did when I was a student, um, I'm actually on leave right now uh, and going back later this year as a student, but um, previously when I was a student, I was one of the board members of the statewide student association, United Council of UW Students. Um, so United Council of UW Students, uh, also known as UC, is the oldest statewide student association in the country. Um, they formed in 1960 around the shared governance statute 36-095 um, that Ben was talking about before. Um, and this was a very crucial moment in student organizing in the state of Wisconsin. 
because basically what this did was it gave students the right uh, to make decisions regarding anything uh, student life related. And so that's where um, they developed the current system of allocating all of their student segregated fees. Um, so it's everything from like university health services to um, their student orgs to the, uh, to the unions on campus. Uh, the physical building unions, not people unions. Uh, and then also having shared gov committees. So like at Madison, there's hundreds of shared governance committees where you have faculty um, and students and what's the, I'm missing the, staff, staff. staff, there we go. Um, and staff each get seats on these shared gov committees that they make decisions and pass them along to administration however their their role is within the actual decision making uh, body um, and so this is everything from like athletics to uh, like the labor board uh, there's like literally hundreds of, of different things as far as like heavy and so this is very crucial and actually getting students the ability to step in and say uh, you know what we're here we're paying tuition um, we're not just here to learn we're also here to like be part of the community on campus. Um, and so since 1960, the um, United Council has gone back and forth depending on its leadership and its format and whether or not it actually calls itself a union. So some years it is a union and like all the board members are walking around calling themselves a union and then other years <laughs> they're not. Um, and so uh, the other piece of history as far as like their formation and calling themselves a union is that the Board of Regents, and I'm forgetting the, day, the exact year, I think it was like uh, early 2000s, uh, forms a, their own kind of thing, they called it uh, student representatives, and so this, was, this is every uh, chair and vice chair from the student governments has their own like administrative thing, and this was formed through um, the, board, the Regents UW system in a way to kind of try to counteract the power that United Council had. Uh, and taking that away and saying like, oh, we're gonna control this. This is like under UW system, trying to control what the, the student governments are deciding or not deciding. Um, so that still exists. So that's a, a tricky thing about the state of Wisconsin is that there is like two competing things. One still instituted through U UW system and not specifically organized by the students. And then one that is completely run by students. So United Council, the students decide all the budgets, they decide um, staff hiring, um, they decide what their budget priorities are, and they actually move forward along with staff and, and making their campaigns happen. And so uh, currently, United Council, uh, this last budget cycle, um, got a really big blow where their current funding structure is based on this thing called a mandatory refundable fee. And so, and I'm talking about finances because when it comes to like student unions and actually being able to be, um, be powerful, finances are a big thing that students struggle with. And so in this mandatory and fundable fee, um, the state legislature basically took that away from them and said, we don't want it to be mandatory anymore. You can ask people for that fee, which is only $3 a semester, um, but we don't actually want, to, we don't think it should be mandatory because it's hurting the affordability of college or whatever it is. <laughs> that's, just like, that's the statement I got from Walker's office. So, <laughs> that this was going to help make college affordable, not having that $3 a semester. Um, anyway, so, uh, so that's, going forward, I think it's going to be interesting to watch how United Council handles that. Because this $3 a semester from 140,000 students really, you know, gave them the ability to have 13 staff and to have, you know, run like five to six campaigns. And so uh, I think we're gonna see what happens in the next year and how they're able to actually tackle that. Um, but the other big thing that students are dealing with right now as far as shared governance is this right of allocating their fees. So that's the other like big fight that we see happening um, is, what, is like which fees can they allocate and which ones are these like supposed non-allocable that the administration basically sends them a budget and says approve this or else. And so uh, I think that's another thing moving forward that's really gonna determine how shared governance works. And then students are continuously pushing that as well and trying to expand that envelope and expand, okay, what do we actually mean by shared governance? 
should students have a have say in things beyond just student life, um, like curriculum, for example? Should that also be something um, that students are, are having a, a more active say in? And uh, I think student associations like United Council, um, if they actually start organizing themselves like unions, so especially if United Council decides to move forward and actually collect union dues, so that $3 mandatory federal fee is actually treated like union dues, um, and actually getting people to say, you're specifically a member, you're not automatically a member, uh, might also be able to kind of like push that transition to United Council calling itself a union again. Um, and the other piece I left out was that one of the things when the legislature was debating this, this fee is that it was the association calling itself a union that came up. And that was one of the things that some of the Republican legislatures jumped on is like, oh, this group has called themselves a union in the past. We shouldn't have any mandatory. So, um, I don't know, with that, I'll kind of move on. I can touch on more stuff later. Uh, so, thank you. Yeah. Um, and sitting to Jolie's left is Leland Pan. And uh, Leland is a member of the Dane County Board of Supervisors. He represents a student district uh, on the county board. Uh, he's a member of the Green Party and Progressive Dane uh, locally. And uh, he also has done a lot of student labor organizing, both here and also nationally around student union issues. So uh, we want to take it away. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, just a bit of background of my involvement in both student labor issues is that uh, one, I am first and foremost a member of an organization on UW-Madison's campus called Student Labor Action Coalition, which uh, works on um, labor solidarity issues um, by students, by usually undergraduate students. Um, we worked closely with the TAA, the Teaching Assistance Union, uh, with the uh, campus ASPMES. <clears throat> and uh, we've also worked on international and national issues. Uh, most recently worked on um, Palermo's workers' issues out in uh, Milwaukee, and also uh, with Adidas and their sweatshop issues. So, uh, I mean, Slack works on labor issues on all levels. And uh, second, in terms of student issues, I've also had the um, okay, pleasure is the right word, misfortune of being on UW Madison Student Association, uh, which is the Associate Student of Madison. And I think my experience there really highlights, uh, I think, a point Ben brought up about why. You know, student unionism and like student association, student governments are two different things, and they play two different roles. And you know, having a strong student association does not uh, take away the need to have a strong student union. Um, you know, and one of the things I think brought up was the sort of position that, say, take ASM is, uh, is in, is that they're in the position where they're advocating for students, they're struggling with the administration and the shared governance process that Jolie laid out. Um, but they're also, you know, governing. They're also allocating money to student associations. You know, there's also politicking within that. And so, at that point, and we're talking about a lot of money, Ten, yeah. tens of millions of dollars annually. Yeah. Forty, I think. Forty, 40 million. For just algebra, right? Right. So, yeah. so theoretically, like supposedly, segregated fees comes up. So right, more and probably more. like statewide, it's probably more like a hundred million. Yeah. So it's it's a decent chunk of money that theoretically students are supposed to have a control over. Theoretically, um, and so what happens when you have this sort of like politicking body as supposedly the advocate for students is that well, first of all, you get a lot of folks involved who are not there for advocating for students. You attract a lot of people who are interested in the title of student government, who are interested in the title of managing that much money, uh, who frankly are interested in a career in you know building connections at networks, and obviously. When students want to do that, that's totally understandable. You know, we all have a job career to try to you know figure out when we leave college. But um, but that I think is detrimental to the student movement um, because at that point you have a lot of people who are interested in uh, playing games with you, a fellow student, who are interested in uh, building connections with administration rather than fighting administration because they view administration as a stepping stone to their future career. Um, and so you get a lot of divided interests and you don't get an effective student voice in my opinion. Also, since that they are sort of a governing body and they are allocating money to student organizations, you end up with this weird dichotomy of a lot of student organizations that would otherwise be advocating strongly for student issues or uh, have their hands tied because they're busy fighting fellow students for funding. Um, so, so that sort of, I think, outlines the issues of why like, a student union is necessary because you need an organization that is explicitly laid out to advocate issues for students. I think historically United Council has tried to play that role sometimes successfully, sometimes less so because of the makeup. 
Um, the last thing I want to touch on, going back to my Slack uh, times, is uh, Student Labor Action Coalition. We call ourselves Slackers, which is funny because I think most of the members are some of the hardest workers I know. Um, but the you know there is a real need for students and workers, especially on campus, to be working together and to understand each other's struggles. I mean, I don't know how many workers I work with on campus are also former students, for one thing. So um, you know. We, as students, have to pay you know, an absurd amount for tuition, try to work uh, to pay that tuition, and we're getting paid at the university. The median income for a student worker is $8.50 an hour. Uh, this while the university claims to pay all its workers a living wage. But student workers are exempt because students are here to uh, learn, not to work. Uh, it's like, well, if we're here to learn, not to work, don't charge us tuition. But, uh, <laughs> so, um, so that's our median income. So right there, you can see a need for students to be organizing, not only as students for tuition, for their, for their, for their curriculum, for all that, but they should need to be organizing as workers. Uh, there are over 10,000 student worker jobs. That means over a quarter of student, uh, undergraduate students work at the university on some level. Um, and uh, not only that, a lot of these people will then leave their $8.50 hour job, have their student loan debt, and end up working for the university for $12 an hour, their supposed living wage, waiting for them. So. Uh, you know, it shows the need for that. It shows that the struggles that students go through uh, will be the struggles that workers go through, and you know these struggles are aligned, and there is a benefit to working together. Um, I just one little story before I you know, hand it over to Katie uh, is that I remember my time in ASM. Our university is currently going through an overhaul of its personnel system, uh, trying to take advantage of certain loosened labor laws um, because the university inherently, no matter what. You know, the university is an interesting institution where I think most of the people working there, including administration, were identified as maybe liberal, but they, their role, their job, whether whatever their personal opinion is, is inherently a uh, conservative anti, uh, conservative consolidation of power is what they're interested in. Um, so in this personnel system, they have to play to the shared governance system that Jolie laid out, and so students, faculty, and staff need to have a seat on the table. And I remember that they were very reluctant about giving labor any sort of seats on the table. And they sort of gave them one token seat on each committee. And, um, and so I, I was in charge of appointing the students to, uh, to the committee. So I ended up picking a bunch of graduate TAA members, union members, to those committees. You know, people who understand student issues, but also understand labor issues. So um, I think that's just an example of um, benefits that could happen if students and workers better understand each other's struggles, better understand how they overlap. Thank you. And our, our final uh, uh, the lead participant, panelist, presenter, however you want to uh, say it, is Katie Zaman. And she is a graduate student in sociology, a member of the Teaching Assistance Association, uh, which I was a member of, and probably other people in this room at various points. And um, you know, I do want to say that Jackson Potter is listed. He ended up not being able to make it today. So he will be here tomorrow at the sessions that he's listed for tomorrow. But I just want to acknowledge that um, that we're missing the K through 12 end of this discussion up here. So I'm going to be counting on people out there to contribute to that. And maybe we can contribute some of our thoughts to that. Katie, please take it away. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about segregated fees too. Um, segregated fees from uh, from the graduate student end, where we have to pay them. Um, the services that are provided through segregated fees are amazing, and we support that activity wholeheartedly. Um, but each semester, it costs us five hundred dollars, um, and you have to. It used to be that you had to pay that after receiving only one paycheck. And so my paychecks as a 50% project assistant um, are $1,444 gross. Um, so you take out health insurance, I'm a single mom, so that's 100 bucks. Take out taxes, take out all of that stuff, and then you take out $500 for seg fees. I have nothing to live on for that month. So. Um, the TAA, we were actually kind of starting to organize around what Leland was talking about with the HR redesign, and we go out and try to talk to people about this, and if... And I, I, the human, re, 
human resources reasons. I just remember yeah. that most people in the room are not from Wisconsin. So right, sorry. Yeah. So this, um, you know, replacing the collective bargaining agreement with some sort of shared governance um, set of policies from the HR department. We really felt like we needed to keep an eye on that, but it turned out to be so difficult to understand. We put three of our best members on that, like full time. Um, and although everyone agreed that it was important, it just wasn't like the best organizing tool. So in our conversations, the thing that came up the most was segregated fees. Like I can't afford to pay my segregated fees. I feel like I have to pay $500 to be an employee at this institution. Um, so we started organizing around that and got a ton of signatures and started talking to our professors and our, all of our departments and saying, this is really a burden for us. Um, what, you know, we want to try to push back against this and either you know, move the date a little bit so we can at least have a couple of paychecks so we can pay it off, or remit it all together. And so um, even without any kind of actions or anything, administration right away was like, okay, we'll push the date, the due date back to December. So now we have three paychecks before we have to pay our sick fees. And that made us all so excited that we decided to go one step further and demand a raise. Um, we started a, a campaign called Pay Us Back. Um, and we were demanding a raise because we haven't had one since 2009. Um, I have all the figures here. Our pay on average was um, somewhere, oh, 14% um, below the median of Big Ten schools um, and 10% below national research universities. Um, so like, you know, obviously it's hard to recruit grad students to a university when they're not really going to be paid. Um, the same as they would get paid at a different institution. They're going to take the, the institution that gives them more funding. So um, long story short, we got our professors on board. Um, we got the Department of Anthropology, Botany, Communication Arts, um, we call it Kami Soch, which is uh, Community and Environmental Soch. <laughs> um, counseling Psychology, Chemistry, Curriculum and Instruction, and Policy Studies, English, Philosophy, and of course Sociology. All of those departments, um, the faculty agreed and, and at their meetings or whatever said, yes, we are making a statement that our students need to, our graduate students need a raise. Um, <coughs> And so the awesome news is, we just found out last week that we got a raise. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be 4.67%, um, <laughs> where <laughs> it brings us to parity with research assistants, because research assistants got paid more than TAs or PAs. So we're now, you know, level. And it's still 9% um, below the median, but it's an important partial victory to, um, I mean, we don't have collective bargaining rights, but we do have the power to make this happen because we've been sort of following the CTU model, that's why I'm wearing this shirt today, where we organize, we focus on talking to people about what are the issues that you care about and that you need changed in your workplace. And they got excited and involved and brought in their friends and then all of a sudden, we have this huge membership. Um, so yeah, I, what, what Leland said about the importance of working across these different um, parts of the university, our next plan, now that we've got our professors sort of in the bag, um, we're <laughs> moving on to undergrads. And these are the students that we teach. We teach most of the classes on campus. So our working conditions are their learning conditions. And we think that there's like really big um, opportunities for collaboration here. So um, yeah, I'm really excited about the possibilities. Um, we're still pushing for more. We're pushing for um, a raise that is equal to the amount of seg fees so that it's, it offsets each other so we don't actually have to pay to work at our job. Um, and yeah, we'll continue from there. But. Um, Getting this raise has definitely been a boost to our morale. 
it's been kind of tough here in Wisconsin <laughs> over the past Can couple Can you explain years. a little bit about that? I mean, how many people in the room did not know that, that um, public university workers don't have collective bargaining as we knew it anymore? People did not know that. Oh, with the, with the as a state workers. Yeah, that if you were yep. here five years ago, you know, you go to campus and you have the collective bargaining arrangements you're familiar with, right? Yep. It doesn't exist anymore. So the fact that the TAA has survived and actually won victories despite that mm -hmm. is pretty significant. So it's been very tough. So we actually lost what's called dues checkoff um, with Act 10, which basically um, before Act 10, if which you're like in slavery. our Act 10, it was Walker's budget repair bill. <laughs> the thing that made us all go crazy and live in the capital for 17 days. <laughs> um, so basically, um, it, it took away dues checkoff, among other things. So that meant that whereas before, you just become a TA and you're automatically a member of the union and paying dues. Now we don't have that. We have to go out and talk to every single person and convince them why they should join the union and say things like, well, we just want you a raise, even though you're not, you're not in the union. Um, we're, we're working on X, Y, and Z, what's important to you? That's the actual work that we've had to be doing over the past two years. So, make sure. so please, uh, thank you to our, uh, to our lead participants here. So, appreciate you guys for your time together. And, um, and I just want to get a sense of who's in the room. Uh, so how many people here live in the United States? How many people here uh, teach at a public uh, school in terms of K through 12 or have taught? Okay, there's a couple of teachers, good, okay. How many people um, have children in public schools? Or yes. Had, yeah. Had, okay, had, okay, I've had the kids, that's good. Uh, how many people are currently students in, I don't think I see any high school students, but I might be mistaken, any high school students here? Okay. Uh, in, in undergraduate students. Currently an undergraduate student. Technically, I haven't put Jolie in that box, but uh, there we go. Excellent. Uh, graduate students. Okay, wow. How many people are adjunct faculty? Was. Okay, was. You can, you, if I say are, you can, you can make it past tense. I like that. Uh, how many people are full-time faculty in, uh, in uh, a university or college? Uh, how many people here came because they're just interested in the topic and they're actually pretty distant from education right now? Good. Okay. We need you guys. <laughs> we need you guys. All right. So that's, that's very helpful. Um, I mean, one. I just wanted to reflect on some of the things that you guys uh, presented here. I mean, you heard a lot of talk about seg fees that really, you know, jumped out at me. I think it probably jumped out at, at all of you. Um, and you know, I think it's really important to understand that seg fees are union dues. Mm -hmm. Right, that's why we have seg fees. Students fought for seg fees. Right? They said, we need, if we're going to be autonomous, mm -hmm. we have to have money, <laughs> right? as Jolie was saying. Right? And um, student power has been under attack um, my entire adult life. How many people are familiar with the Southworth decision? The U.S. Supreme Court. Everybody from Wisconsin. Okay. <laughs> Anybody out there familiar with it? Okay. This is a Supreme Court decision, 9 to 0. Okay? Very important decision for higher education. Uh, the Alliance Defense Fund, a right-wing, corporate-funded, Christian evangelical uh, outfit based in Arizona, sued the University of Wisconsin. They named uh, as, uh, as evildoers the Campus Women's Center, the UW Greens, the Black Student Union, the International Socialist Organization, a couple other organizations that uh, many of us belong to at the time, as being um, entities that they did, that, that their clients, a couple uh, uh, students at the university, uh, one of whose whose name was Scott Southworth, uh, did not want their student fees uh, going to, right? So they said, their argument was, our clients have First Amendment freedom of association right not to associate with these groups that promote equality, sustainability, <laughs> and so on, right? Um, and they lost. Okay, Supreme Court ruled against them, nine to zero. However, the court decision was kind of a pyrrhic victory. It was not a very good decision, and it was used by um, those who hate the idea of students having money that they control, uh, because they don't like what students do with their money, right, to um, destroy 
uh, the use of student fee money for organizing purposes. So when they talk about $40 million, almost none of that money goes to political organizing anymore. And when I say political, I don't mean in elections, I mean like advocacy, right? In my day, the student movement put tens of millions of dollars nationally into advocacy work. And the reason why I'm so interested in this question personally is because we could not get labor to pay any attention to this when it happened, okay? The, the right of workers to have union dues and to organize was under attack at the same time. We said, hey, we're in this together, you know, and we're more important than you think we are, right? But we could not get organized labor to do anything to help us at the time, right? Outside of some campus unions, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so this is a critical question, right? So you have these struggles going on in times when everybody's under attack at once, people unite. But the overall movement for democracy and the progress movement in the United States has been weakened because students have been taken out of the picture in some pretty substantial ways and their economic conditions are much worse than they used to be. You know, when I entered the University of Wisconsin, the median family income was in today's dollars $47,000, which was in today's dollars the median family income in Wisconsin, right? When I left as a law student many years later, uh, it was two and a half times that, okay? so. What that has meant has been that um, students have been under attack, they're not as much of a part of the picture, unions have been smashed, <laughs> yeah. you know, in terms of labor unions. How do we fix this thing, right? And how do we fix the problem, for example, when you're struggling, I mean, I don't, it, we don't even have struggles in Wisconsin around affirmative action anymore. <laughs> Back in the 90s, we did, right? Yeah, um, a little, yeah, a little <laughs> but, but it's not, you know, it, it, it's because there's, yeah, there's so many pressing fights right now. Yeah. But, um, you know, the, the what happens in K through 12 impacts what happens here, yeah. right? And so somehow this stuff has to all come together in a lasting way, and that hasn't happened successfully yet, right? You see the interest in it. I mean, student unionism, as you can see, is the, dis is the discussion in the student movement right now. That was not the case 15 years ago. So students are at the table, you know, how do we move forward here? Um, and so that's the first question I wanna ask is, uh, is one big union doable? in education, one big union. And by one big union, I don't mean that there's only one education union in the United States. Uh, you know, boy, I would be frightened if the National <laughs> Education Association or the American Federation of Teachers were the only education union in the US, uh, having been a member of both of those in various points. Uh, although I'm proud of our AFT leadership in Wisconsin. Um, but um, what I mean is unions that organize in K through 12, and higher education that bring together all the people who have a stake here. So I'll, if any of you want to respond to that, let's start up here and then let's turn it over here and let's talk about some of the challenges and possibilities that we see. Go ahead. Um, I think absolutely that's, that's an awesome vision to have. Um, so the challenge is gonna be finding that on the ground um, and I think we did a little bit of that as the TAA with our professors and, um, you know, identifying why it is that people are, like, declining to come here. And they had their own data that they had already been seeing declining enrollment rates, and they were able to back that up. Um, next is undergrads. How do we cross that? barrier of like I'm your kid, you know, <laughs> um, to like, hey, we're both students here, we're both workers, um, we both deserve a high quality public education, um, what's our shared vision for that? So, yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, I don't know, I think not only is having all these different, you know, just group you know, people in uh, education working together um, important. It's necessary at some point that work needs to be done and bringing all these folks together. I mean, my biggest frustration on campus has always been the sort of lack of sort of shared work done by different folks, not only between, say, like staff or students, or also like within students or within staff, within faculty. Uh, my mother is a staff at the university, and my father is a faculty at the university, so I hear all.